Good morning. morning. Very good to see you. We've got a three-day weekend. Some have turned it into a four-day weekend going on for a lot of folks and a lot of our own members that are gone today. Never know how many we're going to have as visitors. We do have a few, and we're glad that you have, have come to be with us today to worship God with us. I used to be able to sing tenor to 618, and so I was scratching that out. I don't know that I'll ever be able to sing the bass to 651, and I was scratching that out. So I went from one extreme to the other, Clint. I want you to know that from tenor to bass. And uh, <clears throat> I don't know that I can preach now. <laughs> but those are beautiful songs. I'm not even sure that we've, uh, it's been, if we've done 651 in our assembly here, but it's a beautiful song. Uh, really, really uh, like that song. And I think we, we, we did our best. And it's the sentiment. We are singing with the spirit and with the understanding. That's what this is all about. I want to say this before I get into this morning's lesson. I don't know, maybe I should have waited because it was the week and a lot of people had gone to, to do the report in Africa for uh, tonight. We're going to be doing that. Maybe I should have done it next week. But then, lo and behold, other people will be gone too. That just is how it works. And uh, so we are going to try our best to record it. Uh, we've been having some compatibility issues with, with some of the PowerPoint. We think we've got it worked out. We've got to set up some extra speakers because I want you to hear some of the singing of those brethren and their worship songs that we are familiar with, but that obviously are in some of the, the tribal languages there in, in Zimbabwe. So we're going to do that tonight and just hope that you're able to be here tonight to hear that presentation. Um, I, I think you'll find it interesting, but it is an important work that this congregation has found itself in as I addressed in that sermon last Sunday morning and the greetings that come from the brethren in Zimbabwe and South Africa. So we're going to be doing that. And if you noticed on the back cover of the bulletin as well, there's an announcement about that. And so uh, just call your attention to that. As I think about opportunities to serve God, to serve God and to make a difference in the world, and in the kingdom that God allows us to be a part of. That God gives us wonderful opportunities to serve him and to glorify him. And the question that I want to ask in the very beginning is this. What do we do with these opportunities? As Christians, every one of us have been given opportunity. Opportunity to put God first. To make his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, our Master. Number one in our lives. And not allow anything else to come before that. And not allow ourselves to become lifted up in pride or arrogance. And where we put too much trust or confidence in self. Which will always take us away from the will of God when we do that. Saul had such a great beginning with wonderful opportunities. But something happened when we think of King Saul, the first king of Israel. And we know that he initially did possess or exhibit remarkable characteristics. God had chosen him for a reason. I want you to take your Bibles, and we're going to be spending some time in 1 Samuel. So take your Bibles, and please turn to the Old Testament and go to 1 Samuel to begin with in chapter 9. In first chapter, in first Samuel chapter 9, and you'll be reminded that God had been the leader of the people of Israel, and while he had sent them judges, as many of you are studying the book of Judges on Wednesday night, and we know that Samuel himself was, as it were, the last of the judges and one of the first of the great prophets in the nation of Israel. But the people had requested a king. They had not rejected Samuel. They had rejected God as God had to remind Samuel of that. But they wanted a king and so a king they would receive. Even though they were warned that upon receiving a king, he's going to require of you many, many things that you're not going to be pleased about. But God granted their wish. But God would make the king. The king would be identified as the anointed king of Israel. 
that he would be anointed and he would have God's blessing and that as long as the king would be faithful to God, that he would love the Lord and love God's will, that he would prosper, he would do well, and it is even in the plan of God that this kingdom could continue in the family of these particular kings if he would do his will. God saw something very special in Saul to begin with. And in chapter 9 and beginning at chapter 9, beginning at verse 1, it says, There was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish. So he is of the tribe of Benjamin. This son of Kish, the son of Abial and Zeror, and the son of Bekarath, and it's just going on and on and on with some of those who of his grandfather, great-grandfather, and so forth that preceded him. But he says that he was a Benjamite and a mighty man of power. Verse 2, and he had a choice and handsome son whose name was Saul. And there was not a more handsome person than he among the children of Israel. From his shoulders upward, he was taller than any one of the people. One thing that we immediately find out about Saul is he was a standout character, a figure, just of a man. Of a man that scripture tells us was a good looking man, a handsome man, and that was tall. Many of the studies, historically, archaeologically, we understand that probably the average height of a, of, of, of a Semitic individual back in these days was probably about five foot five, five foot six. And, and here was a man, just suppose that, that, that he is nearly six feet tall, and he would, be, he would stand out. We know that in the very beginning that, that God is with him, and if you drop on down to in the same chapter in verse number 21, even Saul, beginning in his own humility, cannot understand why he's being picked. And he answers and he says, this is verse 21 of chapter 9, Am I not a Benjamite? Now remember that Benjamite, that's the smallest of the tribes of Israel, the scripture says. And my family, the least of all of the families of the tribe of, of Benjamin, why then do you speak like this to me? And when he is being told by Samuel that, listen, you've been chosen by God, that you're going to become the king of Israel. In his own humility, <clears throat> he looks at his circumstance and can't understand why, why would you say these things to me? This just does not make sense. And, and we see that in verse 22, now, now Samuel took Saul and his servant and brought them into the hall and had them sit in the place of honor among those who were invited. And there were about 30 persons uh, in that situation. You know, as we would look at the next few chapters, a couple of chapters in particular, and we know that Saul is going to be anointed as king. And I want us to, to remember that this was not going to be an easy transition. That while God has chosen Saul to become the king, there are going to be some people that are going to question that. Now don't forget, these are the same people that have questioned even Samuel being a judge and a leader. They are the same people that were dissatisfied with Eli, the high priest, and his sons. And there was good reason to be dissatisfied. But these were the same people, the same mentality. Says, we want a king. We want a king just like the rest of the nations have. So you've got to understand their attitude to begin with. They are not thinking spiritually. So they look at this and they, maybe they're thinking the same thing. You're going to give us a king and he's going to come from the tribe of Benjamin? Down there to the south? He probably won't even represent the whole nation as well. Benjamin was to the extreme south of the whole nation of Israel, the people of Israel. Small tribe. Not even a family that is really noteworthy for anything. And so they begin to call into question. You know, if there's a general attitude that existed amongst these people, that they call into question the plan of the will of God anyway. And there are going to be some that will immediately object to what he has done. But then we find out as you would go to chapter 11. And after it is made known that God is going to anoint him, he's going to become the king. And that God sees something in him and God even through the prophet Samuel reminds Saul that when you do what is right, the spirit of the Lord is going to be upon you and you're going to be able to do great things in the kingdom. A problem arises in chapter 11. And there's an Ammonite by the name of Nash. And he comes up and he can camps against Jabesh Gilead. Now when you look in your map and you would see, and, and don't forget that Jerusalem is not a capital city yet. That's not going to take place yet. 
But when you look just to the north and to the east and up there just north of the Dead Sea, about halfway up before you get to the Sea of Galilee and, and just right on the east side of the Jordan River, and there's this area called Jabesh Gilead. And you have in that land who is still a dwelling because they had not been completely driven out as God wanted them to the beginning, but here there are Ammonites present. And this Naash, he comes up and he encamps against them. And he, there he says, there when we read verse 1, then Naash the Ammonite came up and encamped against Jabesh Gilead. And all the men of Jabesh said to Naash, make a covenant with us and we will serve you. And Naash the Ammonite answered them, on this condition I will make a covenant with you that I may put out all your right eyes and bring reproach on all Israel. Now can you imagine making that kind of a covenant agreement? That we're going to be able to be in a relationship here but here's what you've got to allow me to do. They're going to take the men and going to take out their right eyes and then <clears throat> to bring a reproach upon Israel. Verse 3, the elders of Jabesh said to him, Hold off for seven days that we may send messengers to all the territory of Israel. And if there is no one to save us, we will come out to you. So the messengers come to Gibeah of Saul and told the news in the hearing of the people. And all the people lifted up their voices and wept. Now there was Saul. Now enter Saul in this situation. And the people are crying. They're weeping. They're very upset. And in verse 5, coming be behind the herd from the field, and Saul said, What troubles the people that they weep? And they told him the words of the men of Jabesh. Then the Spirit of God came upon Saul when he heard this news, and his anger was greatly aroused. Now let me just make this short in chapter 11. Saul, with great courage and conviction, gathers Israel together, gathers the men of Judah together, those of the north and those of the south, and he puts, again, he puts together a force of 330,000 men. And what he is able to do then is to thwart, to stop these advances and these threats of Nash the Ammonite. And now when you drop on down to verse 12 in chapter 11, then the people said to Samuel, this is after great victory because of the leadership of Saul, who's going to become the anointed king, who's proven that he's a man of great character at this point and a man that can have exercise real leadership <clears throat> because he has that ability, he has that potential. God sees us in this man. And now the people in verse 12 said to Samuel, who is he who said, shall Saul reign over us? Bring the men that we may put them to death. Remember, in, the, in chapter 10, there are those rising up and saying, wait a minute, who's the Saul? And they're not willing to support him. They have articulated their opposition to Saul. But look what Saul has done. They said, bring those men that oppose him. Let's put them to death. You know what they're saying? Saul's good. Saul's good here. He's strong. He's doing the right thing. But notice what Saul says. He's not after retribution. Verse 13 of chapter 11. But Saul said, Not a man shall be put to death this day, for today the Lord has accomplished salvation in Israel. Then Samuel said to the people, Come, let us go to Gilgal and renew the kingdom there. So all the people went to Gilgal, and there they made Saul king before the Lord in Gilgal. There they made sacrifices of peace offerings before the Lord, and there Saul and all the men of Israel Rejoiced greatly. Let me ask you something. Are things looking good for Saul as king and the people of Israel? Are they looking good? What do you think? Are you with me this morning? Saul's doing the right thing and the Spirit of the Lord is with him. But I want to go back to this point that God gives us wonderful opportunities to serve him, to glorify him, to do his will. And Saul at first takes advantage of these opportunities and he's being used and he is fulfilling the desires of God and great success will come. And there's no reason why Saul should not be able to be a very prosperous, successful, godly king in Israel. But it's going to change. And I'll tell you why it's going to change. That out of his own pride, out of his own arrogance, he develops a lack of faith or confidence in God. 
And when we stop trusting in God, and we take that confidence that should be totally in God, and we take that confidence and we either put it in ourselves or something else other than God, then there's going to be problems. And this is what sadly, tragically happened to Saul, who had such a wonderful, positive, strong beginning. But now he's going to make mistake after mistake after mistake. Do you know, even later on, later on in his kingship, later on in his life, and remember, the one who had served him very loyally was this man who was after God's own heart. It was young David. And Saul develops this intense jealousy towards David, and he wants David dead. Had David done anything to Saul that was deserving of death? No, he was faithful and loyal to his king. And you remember that as you look at the end of 1 Samuel, on two different occasions at least, on two different occasions, David had an opportunity actually to kill Saul. But would David do it? No. He says, because that's the anointed king of God. And after the second time that David spared the life of Saul, and you find this in 1 Samuel chapter 26, in chapter 26, and it is here in verse 21 that David now has spared his life twice, and it is here that Saul admits, 1 Samuel 26, verse 21, Indeed, I have played the fool and erred exceedingly. The whole concept of the meaning of the word fool here and the Hebrew word that we have there is pronounced sakal. And in this hiskalati is literally I have played the fool is the idea that he has been literally very silly in the decision making process in his life. He has made bad decisions. They have been foolish decisions that, again, one commentator strong says even to be silly. Brown Driver and Briggs says to be foolish in a moral or a spiritual sense. He says, I have played the fool. I was thinking about that, and we've often heard that expression, that that quotation of Saul, that I played the fool. And I was thinking about that, and I thought, you know what? There are a number of times some significant times that Saul had played the fool that I think it's important for us to kind of look at briefly and make some applications. And they're all within this time of his being king when he had opportunity to do the right thing and to glorify God and that his kingdom could be strong and that it would be even go on perhaps to his son Jonathan. And yet none of that's going to happen because he played the fool. Again, this was not Saul's first time to play the fool when he was foolishly trying to have David killed and when he foolishly allowed his life to be be propelled by envy and jealousy. There are the times that he played the fool. Go to chapter 13, in 1 Samuel chapter 13, and here we read about Saul's unlawful sacrifice at Gilgal. Now, what's very interesting about this is that another situation had arisen. But Saul is given some very specific instructions by the prophet of God, Samuel, of what to do. And he was told by Samuel, the prophet of God, and this was the will of God, that even though there was going to be turmoil and there were going to be problems and there were going to be an enemy he was going to have to face, that would be, again, another threatening source towards Israel, Samuel is very clear with him that, Saul, I want you to go here. I want you to wait seven days. I want you to wait for me to come, for me to come because an offering is going to be made. In fact, if you, if you look at this, we know that he becomes impatient about the whole thing. In, in chapter 13 and in verse 8, it says, Then he waited seven days according to the time set by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. Now, he's going to come, and he's going to get there in time, But I suppose that Saul thought in his mind that he would get there even early. Saul thought Samuel would get there early. But we see that he's totally impatient about this. 
And he's going to offer this unlawful sacrifice. Look at verse 9. So Saul said, bring a burnt offering and peace offerings here to me. And he offered the burnt offering. Now I want you just to go back, if you will, to chapter 10. This is important. Go back to chapter 10. And we'll start at verse number 6. 1 Samuel chapter 10 and verse 6. Then the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you. And you will prophesy with them and be turned into another man. And this is showing he's not only going to be the king, but he is even going to be able to give forth prophecies, as Saul would. Verse 7, And let it be that when these signs come to you, that you do as the the occasion demands, for God is with you. That as long, Saul, as you're doing the will of God, God is going to be with you. His Spirit is going to be upon you. You're going to make good decisions. You'll be able to do things when you are what? When you're faithful to God and when you're patient. And so here's what Samuel tells him in verse 8 of chapter 10. You shall go down before me to Gilgal, and surely I will come down to you to offer burnt offerings and make sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days you shall wait till I come to you and show you what you should do. I'm going to ask you. Were his instructions, the prophet of God, Samuel, were his instructions clear to Saul? Seven days. Wait. And furthermore, who's going to offer the sacrifices and the burnt offerings? Who's going to do it? Not Saul, but Samuel is supposed to. So when you go back to chapter 13, and you have this whole situation that has come up, And Saul becomes totally impatient. And he goes ahead and he offers the sacrifices. There are some, and there's a debate into this, was was this in violation because he was not a priest? You know, Samuel really wasn't a priest. He he studied with Eli and was shown about the priesthood. But but you know what? This isn't even talking about temple or tabernacle offerings. And so while some say, well, the reason it was wrong, it was an unlawful sacrifice, is because Saul the king was a Benjamite, he was not of the tribe of Levi, he was not a priest. And it's true, he was not a priest. But that's probably not the problem. The problem is simply this. The prophet of God says, go and wait for me to come. I will make the offerings and then show you what God wants you to do. And he didn't do that. Period. He didn't do that. But what does he do? Instead, he begins to make excuses. So here in 1 Samuel chapter 13, beginning of verse 11, and Samuel said, what have you done? Saul said, when I saw that the people were scattered from me, that you did not come within the days appointed, and that the Philistines gathered together at Michmash, then I said, the Philistines will now come down on me at Gilgal, and I have not made supplication of the Lord. Therefore I felt compelled and offered a burnt offering. Brethren, the simple point we need to get is this. Saul was told what to do. Wait seven days. He was told that Samuel would give the offerings. He was told that Samuel, the prophet of God, would tell him all that the Lord wanted him to do. But here he says, I felt compelled. And I'll tell you what happens. is because he felt compelled. He quit trusting in God. He quit trusting in what the prophet of God had told him. And he felt compelled to do his own thing. It was a total lack of faith. Are there times, listen, are there times that we know with clarity what the scripture tells us and what the scripture, how the scripture guides us, but we begin to question maybe the wisdom of scripture? We become impatient and then we feel compelled to do it our way, to go in the direction that we think is right at the time. And I want to tell you right now that that is a total lack of faith. And this is why Samuel's response to him in verse 13. And Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. Same Hebrew word, by the way. You have done foolishly. What you have done is literally silly. It is empty-headed what you have done. Because you have not put your trust in God. You put your trust in yourself. His unlawful sacrifice was because of his lack of faith, trust, or confidence in God. And he felt, this is something I'll just have to do for myself then. 
and not wait for the prophet, not do it the right way. And brethren, all I can tell you is that when we look at, the, at a passage like this, this is written for our learning, this is preserved for us that we might understand. Because how many people today, and historically have done the same thing, but how many people today make many similar type of mistakes today? And you know what it is? That God tells us what to do. He shows us how we're to worship him, how to serve him. He tells us what we're to be as Christians, what we're to be as the church of the Lord. But then people feel compelled to do it a different way. Why? Because they stop trusting in God and they stop looking to God's word. It's a lack of faith, total trust in God. It's a confidence issue. This is why the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews 11, 6, but without faith, it's impossible to please God. Listen, the faith there is our confidence in God that we're going to do it God's way. And that faith comes by hearing and hearing by God's word, does it not? So here we have Saul, and what does he do? He does what people naturally have a tendency to do, make excuses for his actions. How many people are going to make excuses on that day? Jesus talked about that in Matthew 7. You know, in verse 21, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does what? The will of my Father who is in heaven. Did Saul do the will of the Father? He did not. And when that was exposed, what did he do? He tried to make excuses. How many on that day are going to make excuses? And say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Do many wonderful works. Cast out demons in your name. Do many wonderful works in your name. He says, depart from me. I never knew you. You who practice lawlessness or wickedness. My friends, all I can say is that we can look to Saul's unlawful sacrifice as being a faith issue and that because he just did not trust God, did not trust the will of God, he played the role of a fool. And one is a fool when one does not do what Jesus says. When Jesus concluded that powerful Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7, and after he does that in verses 21 through 23 about these people making excuses on that day, he talks about a wise man and a foolish man. And the wise man, Jesus says, is the one who hears these sayings of mine and does them. He's like the man that builds his house, remember, on the good foundation. And when the storms and the rains and the winds come, it stands strong. But he says, he who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them. He's like the foolish man who builds his house on the sand. And when those storms come, that building, that dwelling collapses. How many people, how many souls' lives collapse today spiritually speaking because they stop trusting in God I think it's a lesson for all of us to learn in every aspect of our own lives and our own faith that I know that there are times we're met with great challenges and we sometimes wonder how in the world can we get through this how are we going to be able to achieve can I really deal with that problem can I deal with that addiction can I deal with that relationship problem? Can I deal with the financial woes? Can I deal with all of this? And I tell you what, we must not stop trusting. We've got to keep trusting in God. So yes, he played the role of the fool. But let's go back to 1 Samuel. And I want to go to a second and final account. And this is in chapter 15. 1 Samuel chapter 15. And Saul sparing of Agag, the king of the Amalekites, and many of the animals of that nation as well. 1 Samuel 15, and we know that God now is still speaking through the prophet Samuel. Samuel's a faithful prophet. And Samuel has been given the task once again to deal with Saul. Saul's made some other mistakes in between here as well, but I just want us to see the glaring problem here and why things were not resolved the way they should have been resolved in his life. Verse 1, Samuel has also said to Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people. That's just kind of a reminder, listen, you're still the king right now. Now therefore, heed the voice of the words of the Lord. Now you know what, that should be key right there. Heed the words of the voice of the Lord. Is that not true today? Heed 
The words of the voice of the Lord. This is God's word. Thus says the Lord, verse 2, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel, how he ambushed him on the way when he came up from Egypt. This is going back to some history of many, many years earlier. Now go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, infant and nursing child, ox, sheep, camel, and donkey. They were to eradicate the Amalekites. God had his reason. These people were pagan. These people were idolatrous. These people were vicious. These people were not in any way, shape, or form in right standing with God. They were a brutal, brutish people. And even when it comes to, we sometimes look at these passages and say, the execution, what would be the kill, killing of small children and nursing infants? I want you to think about this. With these nations, do you know what that was for those children? An act of mercy. You know why it was an act of mercy? Let me ask you. These small children amongst the, the Amalekites, the small children, were they innocent in the sight of God? They were. And when they died, what do you suppose would be the condition of their souls, of innocent children? Would they not be safe? But when these tribes were allowed to go on, what type, of those, what type of people would those small children become in time? Rebellious, paganistic, idolatrous people, wicked against God, who become very accountable. We don't think the way God thinks. We have a difficult time, I suppose, really trying to rationalize that. But I want to suggest to you that this is an act or mercy of God. But that's difficult for us to swallow sometimes, isn't it? But it's merciful. But what happens? Verse 5, Saul comes to the city, Amalek, and lay him wait in the valley. And Saul said to the Kenites, Go depart down among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to the children of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. And Saul attacked the Amalekites from Havilah all the way to Shur, which is east of Egypt. He also took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive, and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good, and were unwilling to utterly destroy them, but everything despised and worthless that was utterly destroyed. We see his violation. Once again, Saul transgresses the command of the prophet of God. He goes against the will of God. And he spares the king, which God says, do not spare. And he spares many of these animals, these oxen and sheep, which God says, do not spare. And then not only that, I want you to think about his sin of presumption. You'll see it in verse 12, that after he's done this, Look at his presumption. And this again is his pride. In verse 12, So when Samuel rose early in the morning to meet Saul, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul went to Carmel, and indeed he has set up a monument for himself, and has gone on around, passed by, and gone down to Gilgal. Do you, see, do you know what Saul's done after this? He's gone, and oh yes, he's defeated the Amalekites, but he spared the king, spared the animal. Then he goes to Carmel, and then he erects a monument for himself because look at, look what I've done. I'm successful, victorious king, and all of this. I'm going to tell you what, that is pride through and through. What a presumption. What does Saul love at this point? He's not loving God. What does he love? He loves himself. He loves what he wants, what he desires. But here again, we're going to see that he has to face Samuel. Verse 10, now the word of the Lord came to Samuel saying, I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as king, for he has turned back from following me, and he has not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried out to the Lord all night. You know, I've thought about that. 
And here's Samuel put in these positions. We talked about this even in the Bible class, in Bible class today, and the, and the elders, and sometimes having to face situations that you don't want to face. But here's Samuel. He grieved. He cried all night. He knows what he has to do. Samuel the prophet has to confront the king again. Verse 13, then Samuel went to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Is that even true? Has Saul performed the commandment of the Lord? No. But Samuel says, What then is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen, which I hear? He can hear all of the animals that have been spared. If you've done the will of the Lord, I would not be hearing these oxen, would not be hearing these animals. And Saul says in verse 15, here comes the excuses. They. Who's they? The people. I preached a sermon in Cayucas about, about 23 years ago. You remember that, right? But anyway. And the title of the sermon is simply they. And this is one of the examples, and I went through several examples, and even in Exodus 32 of Aaron, they, the people erecting the gold calf, they, 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 they. Boy, is there a tendency to make excuses, to blame somebody else? Verse 15, they have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. Then Samuel said to Saul, be quiet. thought about that too and, and when hearing excuses from people and sometimes you just want to say you know what be quiet and listen and I will tell you what the Lord said to me last night and he said to him speak on so Samuel said when you were little in your own eyes were you not head of the tribes of Israel and did not the Lord anoint you king over Israel now the Lord sent you on a mission and said go and utterly destroy the sinners the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you swoop down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? There's no matter how you want to look at this and try to justify it, and even as he's going to do, oh, we can use these for sacrifices. That's not going to work. Verse 20. Saul said to Samuel, but I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and gone on the mission in which the Lord sent me and brought back Agag, Agag king of uh, Amalek. I have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took off the plunder, sheep and oxen, the best of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice the Lord your God at Gilgal. little history, American history. What was that little plaque or sign the president... Harry Truman had on his desk in the Oval Office. What, what, what did that say? It does. That's exactly right. The buck stops here. Is that suggesting responsibility, culpability, accountability? They, the people. You know what? Samuel could have said in real good Americana speech, the buck stops with you. You're responsible. You're the king. And all said and done, he did what he wanted to do again because he was lifted up in pride. He'd gone and made a monument for himself. And so in verse 22, Samuel says, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. And to heed, to do that is, to heed the fat, then the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry, because you have rejected the word of the Lord. He also has rejected you from being king. You study the law of Moses. You study the Old Testament. You go back and study books like Leviticus and Deuteronomy, and you study and understand what God thought about divination and witchcraft and all of that. I want to tell you what, people were destroyed immediately, summarily put to death for practicing such things. God would never tolerate any form of paganism or idolatry. So when he says that the sin of rebellion this is as the sin of witchcraft, is as the sin of idolatry, he wanted Saul to understand that what you've done in rebelling against the word of God, the plain, simple, straightforward will of God, you've got to understand what God thinks about that. 
<clears throat> oh, he acknowledges his sin in verse 24. But watch this before we make our final applications. Down in verse 24, chapter 15, Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. In some respects, we almost want to say it's about time that you acknowledge this. I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now, therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may worship the Lord. But Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you, for you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. And as Samuel turned around to go away, Saul seized the edge of his robe and he tore it. He's trying to grab after Samuel the prophet and, and beg him to stay, and he tears it. And Samuel said to him, verse 28, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. And also the strength of Israel will not lie nor relent, for he is not a man that he should relent. Then he said, I have sinned, yet honor me now, please, before the elders of my people and before Israel, and return with me that I may worship the Lord your God. So Samuel turned back after Saul, and Saul worshiped the Lord. But I want to tell you something, that as we look at the rest of the story on this, his kingdom would not be given to him or to his sons. And we know that near the end of the book of 1 Samuel, both he and his son Jonathan are killed in battle. And the kingdom, in fact, goes to David. David of the tribe of Judah. Brethren, I want to just say as we close that many are not willing today to obey the specific commands of God. Because of a lack, yes, even as we saw in the first point, a lack of confidence or trust, but here because of a lack of true, genuine love. And we can look at this and understand that, that Saul did not love God. He may have said he did to people, but he did not love God. Jesus said in Luke 6.46, listen to it carefully. And why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? Jesus said in John 14 and 15, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. I cannot stress enough to you, ladies and gentlemen, our need to have faith in God and our need to love God, and the way we do that is we quit allowing to put ourselves before God. Our agendas before God. That we put the Lord first in our lives. That we become the, the, the shining examples that Saul should have been to the nation of Israel but failed. Because true faith and true love will always seek God first. How many people won't obey the gospel today because of their own pride, of their own arrogance, because of their own stubbornness or rebellion? The gospel that has the ability to save their souls, Romans 1.16. How many churches are there today that will not follow the pattern that God has given us for New Testament Christianity and they're not willing to, even as God had told Moses, and we read this in Deuteronomy, we read this in Hebrews chapter five, uh, 8 and verse 5, see that you follow the pattern that was shown you in the mount, and as God has shown us what it is to be a Christian, what it is to, to be His church, to be His people. And then we decide to do something else, and it is nothing more than the sin of rebellion. This is about the king who played the fool, and we've got to stop. But this is the king who played the fool. I cannot stress enough. Let's not find ourselves is people who claim to be Christians or people who claim to be people of God and play the fool by making terrible decisions. And I hope that you will meditate upon this Old Testament example that God wants us to know about. If you're ready to obey the gospel, don't make excuses. Don't play the fool. Let us help you. Let us 
show you what the Lord desires. And if you're ready to confess your faith based upon your repentance, you can be baptized today. You need to get your life back right with God. Let's not play the fool. Let's be wise. If we can help you in that decision, let us, let us know. Won't you come at this time? We stand as we sing the song that has been sung.